reflection on sexual orientation and gender identity. And I will serve as a moderator for today's program. Uh, we are thrilled to be presenting this timely webinar entitled Intersection of Identities, Sexual Orientation, Gender Identity, and the Asian American and Pacific Islander Experience. Sponsored by the ABA Commission on Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity, Section of Civil Rights and Social Justice, and the Coalition on Racial and Ethnic Justice. This panel is one of many in a series commemorating Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. The ABA has been putting on these uh, series this month. And if you miss one, please check them out at AmericanBar.org slash CRSJ. And tomorrow is the last one of this series and Ali is posting uh, information on that program and it's not too late to register in the uh, chat box. During today's program, we encourage you to ask questions of our panelists through the Q&A, not the chat function. Um, if you do not see the controls, please ensure your screen is not idle. We will address questions at the end of the program. And we will be sharing a recording of this program to everyone who is registered so that you can share it widely with your networks. And with that, we're thrilled to bring you today's program entitled Intersection of Identities, Sexual Orientation, Gender Identity, and the Asian American and Pacific Islander Experience. For those of us who identify as LGBTQ+, and as Asian American and Pacific Islander, it can often feel like we're living at the cusp of an intersection uh, that is challenging to manage. Today, we have an amazing group of panelists who will shed some light on the varied and diverse experience of the LGBTQ plus AAPI experience. Our panelists today speaking in order are, and I will introduce all of them at this time, Andy Mara, Executive Director, Transgender Legal Defense and Education Fund. She will speak about the AAPI's role in supporting and advancing the LGBTQ community and our rich history that is often forgotten in race and the importance of continuing advocacy and being at the table. Prior to Till Death, she spent five years leading external communications at the Arcus Foundation, managed public relations at JILSAN, a national organization focused on LGBTQ issues in K through 12 education. And she was a co-director at Nodutol for Korean Community Development and served as a senior media strategist at GLAD. Andy currently serves on two boards, including Freedom for All Americans and Just Detention International. She's previously served on the boards and advisory council of Chinese for Affirmative Action, the Funding Exchange Human Rights Campaign and the National Center for Transgender Equality. She has been honored by the White House and the city of New York for her contribution to the LGBTQ community, profiled in the advocates 40 under 40 and listed as one of the Huffington Post's most compelling LGBT people. She's also the recipient of the Gilson's Pat Finder Award, the National LGBTQ Task Force Creating Change Award, NQAPIA Community Callus Award, and the Colin Higgins Foundation Courage Award. Our second panelist is Justice Sabrina McKenna, Associate Justice of the five member Hawaii Supreme Court. She will focus her remarks on the role of cultural values, norms, or traditions in the development and expression of AAPI LGBTQ plus individuals and the unique risk of coming out, particularly with AAPI youth. She also highlights special issues faced by Pacific Islanders and the presence of AAPI LGBTQ plus in the judiciary. Justice McKenna is the first openly LGBTQ judge to sit on the Hawaii Supreme Court where she has served since 2011. After attending University of Hawaii at Manoa on a basketball scholarship as an early beneficiary of Title X, she received a JD from the University of Hawaii William S. Richardson School of Law. And she started her career in private practice, then served as general counsel to Otaka Inc. She became an assistant professor at the University of Hawaii Law School before being appointed a district court judge in 1993. And she was elevated to the circuit courts in 1995 and co-chair the Hawaii Supreme Court Committee on Equality and Access to the Courts and Committee on the Court Interpreters and Language Access. Um, 
In February, she was honored by the ABA Commission on Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity with its Stone World Award. And she's currently working to make sure the Hawaii court rules and jury instructions uh, are non-binary and now makes her own opinions non-binary. Our third panelist is Glenn D. McPantai. He is the executive director of the National Queer Asian Pacific Islander Alliance, which work at the intersection of LGBT equality, racial justice, and immigrants' rights. Glenn will address the intersection of race and the law, highlighting in particular Professor Kenji Kishina's work, who's a, a leader in this uh, area, uh, address multiple minority stress or stigma as an AAPI LGBTQ plus individual. Before his current role, Glenn had a long and distinguished career as a civil rights attorney at the, Democrat, the, the Democracy Program Director at the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund, where he worked to protect and promote the voting rights and political participation of Asian Americans. He continues to inspire new legal minds and future advocates by teaching race and law at Brooklyn Law School and Asian American civil rights at Hunter College, CUNY. He has published scholarly legal articles, authored a number of reports, and has given commentary to numerous media outlets, including the New York Times, USA Today, Boston Globe, CNN, National Public Radio, and I understand this latest for the Philadelphia Inquirer. Glenn attended State University of New York at Stony Brook on Long Island, and as a beneficiary of affirmative action, graduated cum laude from the New England School of Law in Boston. And finally, our last finalist, but not these uh, is Alexander Chen. He's the founding director of Harvard Law School LGBTQ plus advocacy clinic. He will discuss the diversity within, Asian, within the Asian community and the clashes uh, of experiences between um, our sexual identity and our AAPI heritage. And we all, he will also expound further on the intersection between race and the law, particularly from the economic justice perspective. Alex is also a lecturer at Harvard Law School, where he teaches gender identity, sexual orientation, and the law. His work focuses on expanding the rights of LGBTQ plus people through impact litigation, policy advocacy, and direct representation at the national and local levels. Previously, he served as an Equal Justice Works Fellow at the National Center for Les uh, Lesbian Rights, one of the nation's leading LGBTQ plus advocacy organization. There, he engaged in LGBTQ plus impact litigation and policy advocacy in education, employment, healthcare, housing, prison, and juvenile justice and welfare settings. Uh, he has been a member of a number of uh, prominent litigation team, including uh, most recently military cases in Doe versus Trump and Stockman versus Trump. Um, he is a co-drafter of the ABA, uh, AB, uh, Assembly Bill 2119, a bill that made California the first state to guarantee access to transition uh, related health care for trans youth in foster care. He is a recipient of numerous awards, including 40 Best LGBTQ Plus Lawyer Under 40 by the National LGBT Bar Association. Um, he, has received his B he received his BA from Oxford University and MA from Columbia University and his JD from Harvard Law School where he was the first openly transgender editor of Harvard Law Review and work on trans issues at the Department of Justice. He clerked for the Ninth Circuit Court for the Honorable M. Margaret McEwen and in the Southern District of California for the Honorable Gonzalo P. Curiel. These are our wonderful panelists and I, you know, I was gonna shorten their bios, but these are, I wanted to uh, provide some context in terms of who these individuals are who are gonna be part of the panel. So I hope you, um, Indulge me in that. Thank you so much. Um, so our first panelist today is Andy Mara. Andy. Good morning or good afternoon, wherever you may be tuning in. Uh, my name is Andy Mara. Uh, my pronouns are she and her, and I am the executive director of the Transgender Legal Defense and Education Fund, uh, a national organization committed to uh, ending discrimination against uh, transgender and non-binary people nationwide. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you today, um, and uh, especially during Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month, and um, to be joined by such a distinguished panel. Um, 
in preparing for today's remarks and in, in planning for this discussion um, with the panelists, um, as well as the ABA staff, um, we were noodling through a number of different questions and, and, and items that we might want to tackle in, in sharing with you all today. And I think one of the biggest takeaways, at least for myself, um, to impart upon folks that are tuning in and maybe watching later is that Asian American and Pacific Islander folks uh, who identify as LGBTQ plus have been visible and have been doing the work um, as I think as long as we can, as we have a modern historical record. Um, many times I think folks um, uh, cast our community um, as being invisible or being erased. And for sure, there are strong examples of that. And I, I often point to um, uh, the, the 2004 um, piece um, that was put, um, that was produced by a Details Magazine um, called Gare Asian and creating this like stereotypical portrayal of what it means to be either gay or Asian or trans or Asian. And uh, the fact of the matter is we have been here for quite some time. And I think even going further beyond um, what many LGBTQ plus people reference as either Stonewall or uh, Compton's Cafeteria, I often point to um, uh, an image of a person by the name of Nathan Hahn, um, an Asian American um, who was arrested in 1940 um, by the Los Angeles police um, for quote unquote cross-dressing. Um, and there are many other examples of our existence and our contributions and participation in the work for advancing uh, legal, legal and lived equality uh, for our community uh, nationwide. I often look to history as, uh, as a point of reference to ground myself. I was a history kid growing up. I still remain a history buff. And in thinking about the role of our organizations, particularly Asian American and Pacific Islander civil rights organizations or social justice organizations, there is a strong and rich legacy of our organizations and our communities showing up in support of LGBTQ plus issues. Um, I don't think a lot of folks know that, you know, the Japanese American Citizens League in 1994 was the first uh, non-LGBTQ plus civil rights organization uh, after the ACLU to support marriage equality. And I think a lot of it had to do with um, uh, the marriage equality lawsuit that took place um, in the state of Hawaii around that time. I look at folks like Norman Mineta, um, the former US Secretary of Transportation, who also at a time when LGBTQ plus issues were not widely spoken about or not did not receive or benefit from the kind of support that we see today, um, former uh, Secretary Mineta came out in support of LGBT, LGBTQ plus issues, particularly on, on the issue of marriage equality. Um, you know, for myself, um, being a New Yorker, um, and Glenn also being a New Yorker as well, I think both of us were incredibly proud and excited back in 2005 when uh, Justice Doris Lynn Cohan um, ruled in favor of marriage equality. She was an appellate judge and, and, and she found that um, denying uh, marriage equality to five same-sex couples in the state of New York violated the state constitution. Um, and if it weren't for other folks and organizations like that, uh, I don't think that our movement would be, would have the kind of momentum or the kind of impact um, that has led us to this current moment. Um, in thinking about marriage equality, which has been um, a, a landmark issue um, uh, for, for many LGBTQ plus people across the country, um, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders showed up. And um, a few examples, I think, to point to that work, um, especially um, in California, where um, if folks remember Proposition 8 um, uh, came to be, uh, there were a number of organizations and activists who identified as both AAPI and LGBTQ+, um, that came out in support of the issue. A good example is Let California Ring, um, one of the public education campaigns that took place in California. It was one of the first examples 
uh, of a campaign that actively, proactively wove in stories of our community and how we were impacted by marriage equality. And, and also taking the historical context of anti-miscegenation laws and how they've been historically impacted our community. Um, and I think more recently, and I hope, I hope Glenn, you do talk about this work um, in, your, in your remarks, there's been, I think, a continuation of, of that work, um, particularly around the issues of family acceptance. Um, we have seen um, growing momentum in our community, particularly with parents to come out and support their LGBTQ children. And a lot of that work has, has been um, galvanized and has been uh, leveraged uh, to tackle a number of issues, whether it's uh, you know, family acceptance itself or larger issues like the passage of the Equality Act and making sure that every LGBTQ plus American in this country um, is, is treated um, fairly. I also think about how our community has taken all of those advancements and all of that progress and how it's translated into further visibility, but also political power. I look at uh, folks like Congressman Mark Takano or Georgia State Representative Sam Park or State Assemblyman um, Evan Lowe or even um, uh, out of the state of Hawaii, um, Kim Koko Iwamoto, uh, who's the former commissioner of civil rights um, for the state. Uh, all of these folks have played very visible and powerful roles in advancing civic engagement and um, really strong public policy, not just for our communities, but from where they, they live and they contribute to on a day-to-day -day basis. And then lastly, I think what's most important for me as an activist and how I, how I center my day-to-day my, my -day work as an activist, there is a tremendous number of AAPI LGBTQ plus activists that are leading on the front lines, the work for full legal and lived equality across this country. We look at um, folks like uh, Chris Hayashi, who's the executive director and my colleague of the Transgender Law Center. Both he and I are two of uh, executive directors that are leading uh, national transgender rights organizations at the intersections of law and law and policy. We look at folks like Kathy Main Johnson, the executive director of Utopia or the United Territories of Pacific Islanders Alliance, specifically working within trans communities at the intersections of gender identity and also the Pacific Island region. We look at folks like Kathy Kapua, also who lives in Hawaii and is deputy director of the Trans Justice Funding Project or Cecilia Chung, who helped start the Transgender Law Center and who served on San Francisco's Human Rights Commission. This, and also Glenn, Glenn being the former executive director of the National Queer Asian Pacific Islander Alliance. These folks and others in our movement have been on the front lines leading the work. And it's just one data point of many that we can point to the, to the reality that we're not invisible. We're not going to be erased and we will continue to do the work, um, not just uh, for LGBTQ plus folks, not just for Asian American and Pacific Islander folks, but for both of those communities and uh, individuals that identify um, at, those, uh, at those two intersections. Thank you. Thank you, Andy, for uh, sharing such a, a uplifting and uh, message and perspective about uh, uh, our community and uh, the role it's played in um, advancing LGBTQ plus uh, rights. And thank you for your criti ongoing critical work as well. Now our next panelist is uh, Justice uh, Sabrina McKenna. Justice McKenna, aloha. Hey. Aloha everyone. I hope everyone is having a good day. Um, you know, the Asian and Pacific Islander community in the US is very broad and has a variety of cultures. And these cultures have differing attitudes toward the LGBTQ plus community, but there are some commonalities as I will discuss. In terms of my own experience, I was born and raised in Japan and I spent my first grade year in the Philippines. I was raised by a Japanese mother and an American father. And I grew up attending 
US schools in Japan and the Philippines. But after my dad died when I was nine, I was raised solely by my Japanese mother. I lived in the Japanese community and I spoke only Japanese at home and Japanese is my first language. I am a member of the baby boomer generation. And it was only when I was a senior in high school that the American Psychological Association in its Diagnostic and Statistical Manual removed homosexuality from the list of mental illnesses. So what I'm trying to say is I grew up in a different time. When I was growing up, no one was out in high school. There were no LGBTQ clubs or organizations in, any, in my school. And I don't remember one in college either. And I entered the University of Hawaii in Manoa in 1974. And as such, I am one of the currently estimated 22.5 million Asians and Pacific Islanders who live in the United States. Uh, my mother was one of them for a while. She moved to Hawaii in 1991 until she passed away in 1997. So I identify as Japanese American. But Asian and Pacific Islander Americans consist of a vast array of cultures, cultural backgrounds, racial and ethnic backgrounds. Um, and, and so, but what we do have in common in general are two thirds of all Asian and Pacific Islander Americans are foreign born. 80% of us speak a language other than English in their homes. A third of us are not citizens. And so the vast majority of Asian and Pacific Islander Americans are therefore first or second generation and still have very strong ties to the cultures and families of their homelands. Um, and to the extent we are religious, uh, LGBTQ Asian and Pacific Islander Americans are raised in a variety of faith traditions, including but not limited to Buddhist, Christian, Confucian, Hindu, Islamic, Sikh, or others. And those religions come with varying levels of acceptance and affirmation, both in the US and in their home in the home countries. Now, you probably are aware that in many South Asian and Southeast Asian and Pacific Islander traditions, there's been a long history of like scriptural inclusion of LGBTQ people and identities and perspectives in gods and deities um, and positive depictions. Um, and many of these cultures have a history of uh, individuals who don't fit in the Western or traditional binary gender structures. Um, th these cultures sometimes have terms um, and recognition of the third gender, which include the term hijira, in India and Mahu in Hawaii. And you know, even in some East Asian cultures have historically have histories that have accepted homosexuality, including in my home country of Japan among the samurai and the monks. But I think that many Asian Pacific Islander cultures also have in common the influence of the spread of Christianity and Christianity's historical negative attitudes toward the LGBTQ community. And that legacy sometimes continue. So despite the more traditional acceptance of the queer community and API cultures, uh, being LGBTQ plus ended up even being criminalized in some API cultures. For example, in pre-contact Hawaii, there was a reverence for the mahu, um, and I'm not a historian, but I also understand it, it was accepted for Hawaiian chiefs to have same-sex partners. But for example, after Hawaii statehood in 1959, from 1963 to 1973, Hawaii required transgender women to wear a button saying, I am a boy. And one could be arrested and fined for failure to do so. And this was at the Glades, there was a club called the Glades in downtown Honolulu, which was my safe haven when I went to college. It, um, uh, there was drag show, um, it was a haven for the transgender community. But until the year before I came, 
the transgender woman had to wear a button saying, I am a boy and would be arrested for that. And in India, I lecture regularly in India, in, in Japan on some of these issues, but it wasn't until 2013 that the India Supreme Court recognized the hijira. And it wasn't until 2018 that the India Supreme Court finally ruled that section 377 of their penal code which criminalized unnatural sexual behavior, homosexual behavior, they finally ruled it unconstitutional. And note that of the 29 countries in which same-sex marriage is legal, only one is in Asia, and that is in Taiwan. And activists in my home country of Japan have filed lawsuits to have the denial of same-sex marriage ruled unconstitutional. And one district court recently in Sapporo, Hokkaido, the Northern Island, which is where my mother is from, did rule that it was unconstitutional. But the rights of LGBTQ um, in Japan are still way behind. And you know, since 60% of our community, over 60% are immigrants, Many API youth are raised by parents who left their home countries to give um, their children a better life and their families a better life. And for that reason, and because of the uh, stress on the ancestors and the family name and not embarrassing the family and, and sometimes the pressure to conform uh, more of a community communitivistic society instead of individualistic societies, it makes it more difficult for some of our youth to come out. Um, and so, um, and these factors were definitely true for me. I didn't, I finally came out to my mom in my mid twenties. I didn't come out at work until 1991 when Hawaii finally became the third state to say that um, employment discrimination based on sexual orientation was illegal. Um, but in retrospect, you know, when I look back on my life, I realized I covered for many years, and I think Glenn will discuss what that means. Um, but my last position before being appointed to the Hawaii Supreme Court in 2011 was with to head the family court here on Oahu. And I came across some studies then that I think are still relevant. Um, what, what's really most important is your family attitude and the people that are close to you, that you need adults, especially your parents, that, that's the best, that will accept you for being LGBTQ. But I believe that as that acceptance is not as great in our community because um, I saw one study that showed that whereas 77% of Caucasian youth come out to their parents, it was only 51% of Asian and Pacific Islander Americans. And so um, when I came out, uh, when I was appointed to this court in 2011, I thought it was really important for me to be really out. And I uh, became the first um, open member of the uh, LGBTQ community to be of an Asian Pacific, Asian American background to be appointed to a state court of last resort. And now of the 11 state Supreme Court uh, LB, LGBTQ justices, Three of us are Asian American, uh, Lynn Nakamoto of Oregon and Mary Yu of Washington. And, you know, um, you know, Andy has given shout outs uh, in terms of people that really inspired me. They include Kim Koko Iwamoto, who in 2006 became the first uh, person, transgender person to be appointed, uh, to be elected to statewide office. Uh, when she was appointed, uh, elected to the Board of Education. Other people that inspired me, Mia Yamamoto of California, Federal Magistrate Judge Donna Ryu of the Northern District of uh, California, and of course, Glenn, and my good friend, Judge Doris Lynn Cohan of New York. And um, I, just a couple things, points I still wanna, um, wanna make. Um, you know, uh, a recent Trevor Project study showed that 36% um, of LGBTQ youth who experienced discrimination uh, reported attempting suicide, compared to only 7% of LGBTQ youth who did not experience discrimination. So family acceptance, acceptance by others is really important. Mental health continues to be a serious issue amongst our population. 
42% of LGBTQ youth um, seriously considered attempting suicide in the last year. And this is a recent study. Uh, but actually it was 12% of white youth. And I was pleasantly and surprised. And, and although this is still too much, it was also 12% of Asian and Pacific Islander youth. So that was interesting to me. A, a Gallup study show, re, shows that um, the percentage of people that identify as LGBTQ youth are now at 5.6% of US adults. It's up from 4.5% 4, 4, 4 from the Gallup study in 2017. But according to a recent Williams Institute report, of all AAPIs, only 4.5% identify as LGBT, including only 3.8% of Asian Americans and 8.8% of uh, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders. So I wonder why the Asian American percentage is lower. You know, I can tell you that for years, I didn't report to census that I was lesbian. So I wonder if it's more of a willingness to come out and why the Asian American percentage is so much lower than the national average. Um, so a, a few, at this point, I think my time is up. So, but um, on, another thing I wanted to point out is that um, um, what, over one fifth of AAPI LGBTQ adults have been diagnosed with depression compared to 7% of AAPI non-LGBTQ adults. And really interestingly, 30% of Asian American and Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander women, LGBTQ women, have been diagnosed with depression as compared to only 9% of non-LGBTQ AAPI women. And I wonder if that has to do with the general patriarchal nature of the cultures that we're from. So um, finally, um, I'm gonna close by saying that by 2040, nearly one in 10 Americans are anticipated to be AAPI. But uh, there is a study by Yale Law School graduates which showed that Asian American law school enrollment has declined by 28% from 2011 to 2019. So I wanna encourage any young AAPI youth that are out there to consider law as a profession to improve the lives of your communities. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Justice McKenna. And thank you for uh, being an inspiration and a role model and sharing your personal journey, uh, particularly your insights today on some of the issues faced by um, AAPI LGBTQ plus individuals and some of those statistics you shared with us were certainly surprising. So, so thank you. Our next panelist is Glenn McPantai, a fellow, a fellow Filipino American. Um, I pointed out that he was exec, he's the executive director of National Queer Asian Pacific Islander Alliance, but my understanding is Andy correctly pointed out, he's the former, uh, I believe he left the organization several months ago. So Glenn, you could also update us on what you're doing now as part of your introduction. Glenn? Can you hear me now? <laughs> anyway, thanks for being here. Um, you know, as Judge McKenna talked about, I was one, I came out 30 years ago uh, and then nine, mid 1980s at the height of the age crisis. And I was convinced back then I was a femboy and I was convinced I was going to catch AIDS and dying. You know, I was the only Asian in my block. My family came over right at the beginning. Once the restrictions were lifted to come over, we were one of the first waves to come to America, uh, of Asians coming to America. I was the only Asian on the block. Nobody looked like me. Uh, you know, my friend said that my house smelled foodie because my grandmother would fry fish. And I was one of those kids that wanted to commit suicide. And I didn't because of the people who were on this panel, because of the people who showed allyship and support so that I could achieve a potential beyond what I could achieve. And just Ms. Kinna, Alex, Andy, everyone here, you are the ones who supported me and helped me to do so much. And trust me, I know I'm a little heavy, although I, get, I lost some weight since last year, uh, but you know, we are achieving so much. And I've practiced civil rights law for nearly 25 years. Um, 
And I want to talk a little bit about the challenges in the law when it comes to the LGBT Asian, South Asian, Southeast Asian experience. And that the challenge is that law compartmentalizes us. It, it puts us into a particular box. You're either the gay or the Asian or the woman, right? Remember, remember in law school, remember strict scrutiny analysis, you have state action, and then you have a suspect classification. Caroline product footnote four. Oh my gosh, did you ever think you would hear that word again? The most famous footnote in legal in American legal history talks about a discreet and insular minority. When they are facing discrimination, the law will come in to protect them. But the law only comes in in judicial review, only comes in in particular contexts. Racial minorities, women, that's intermediate scrutiny. Where is LGBTQ people? Now the law, and I'm not going to do a legal lecture, but you know it is rational basis scrutiny, and yet um, the the state will lose, which is unusual. Of course, the state won in Korematsu with strict scrutiny analysis. Um, the law compartmentalizes and silos us into identities. Even the work of law firms and in bar associations are often siloed. There's an Asian American group, there's an LGBT group, there's a women's group. Where is it that we can be all of who we are? That we can express all our identities. And that work at our firms and companies and in the bar association is often trying to find where is that intersectionality? where we can achieve all of who we are. Ken, my friend Kenji um, uh, wrote this book called uh, Covering, and my other friend, uh, Dean Wu, uh, who's now at Queens College, wrote another book called Yellow. Uh, and you know what we know is that the Asian American population is only about three to 4% uh, of the nation's population. The law, uh, the LGBT community, a recent Gallup poll showed that uh, LGBT people are about 4%. It's not very big. And we are minorities within a minority community. And oftentimes when we cover, we can pass. In the LGBT context, well, some of us, you could look at it and say, yeah, he's gay. Uh, and then there are others who you'd never know. What does that mean? But it's, let, let's be gender and behavioral uh, normalists for a moment and understand that one could hide their sexual orientation or gender identity, sometimes their trans identity. For Asians, you can't hide being Asian. However, you know how to code shift. We are educated often in the legal profession. We are the largest segment of new associates in law firms. We, are, we don't you know, achieve high levels in the firms and that's a problem of attrition and inclusion, yet we are often seen as the workhorse and at the shores, but we get good jobs. And if we keep our head down and work hard, we can achieve so much. And yet we found out in this year of COVID in Atlanta and in Indiana, Asian American and South Asian workers who were keeping their head down and working, working hard were killed and shot. The apex to a year of being victimized, that we can no longer hide our identity. Our race will no longer protect us. And what we have found, when we thought that we could be, we oftentimes buy into the model minority myth, which is the myth, but we are overall, you know, in the aggregate, a more educated community, and we are using not the victims. Very similar to the LGBT community. Many of us in the LGBT community have achieved high, high recognition and success in our communities. And some of us are out, some of us aren't. But the question is, where can we bring those identities together so that we no longer have to cover? So we no longer have to buy into the model minority myth. And one of the things that I've observed at my new book project, if I can get it funded, at my new, new work, is to really look at both the Asian American and the LGBTQ community. And what I've noticed over the past 30 years, 
I'm a little older than I look. Asians don't raise in, yo. Uh, excuse me. Uh, so I do like some levity. Uh, the law can be so boring sometimes. What I've noticed over the past 30 years is that we have seen a shifting of the burden when it comes to identity. And I think L the LGBT community is pretty remarkable in this. In the 1990s, our goal was to be left alone. The freedom to be what we want to do in the privacy of our own homes between two consenting adults. And we have seen a shift where now we want the world to, and our firms and our companies to recognize us for who we are. We want a picture of our same sex partner on our desk. We want a gender neutral restroom. That it is not I having the freedom to do what I want privately, but it is the society, the company, the firm recognizing who we are and welcoming us. In the same way, that is the Asian American experience. And we have seen since the since Trump called the China virus, the coronavirus the China virus, we have seen the victimization, the harassment of Asian Americans for a year. 60% of Americans have watched and witnessed the blaming or harassment of Asian Americans because of COVID. And yet we have found, and we have found that the FBI found a hundred and 49% increase in anti-Asian violence, stop AAPA hate, 6,000 incidents of harassment and violence. There is so much more work that we need to do. And this is a moment of allyship. As LGBTQ people, we know what it's like to have our bars raided by the police. And so we must stand for Black Lives Matter. As, as Asian Americans, we know now what it is to be victimized. And so we must stand up for LGBT rights and equality. We have shared struggle and we have common cause. I wanna put out two things that I think are challenging realities within the community. And I'm gonna show uh, some clips, Scott. I hope this really works. Uh, should I do good news or bad news? Good news. A poll by the Asian American Legal Defense Fund found that most Americans in 2016 supported the right of LGBTQ people from being discriminated against. The Equality Act is working its way through, co through Congress, not college. Um, and most Americans, uh, uh, Asian Americans, this is a poll of Asians, support our rights. And I was going to do the Asian ethnic one because Justice McKenna talked about religion. I had to do the religious slide around Asian American Hindus, Catholics, no affiliate. Of course, you know, it is challenging with some communities, but most Asian Americans of any religious persuasion supports laws that keep us free from discrimination. The bad news is that when it comes to marriage, the numbers change dramatically. And this is 2012, it's a number of years old, but most of it still holds, is that most Asians actually do not support our right to marry. I have said many times that it's wonderful that we can get married now, but what good is the right to marry if nobody will come to the wedding? For Asian Americans, a wedding is not just a legal proceeding. It is a celebration of acceptance. It is pride. I mean, you know how it is for Asian, Indian weddings, they go on for four days. Asian weddings, you invite everybody. When my sister got married, my mommy invited the accountant. There were like 300 people. I'm like, Ma, the accountant is here. Why is he here? It's because your sister's getting married. But when we as queer and trans people get married, will anyone come? And so the work that we need to do is about promoting acceptance promoting acceptance of our communities in the languages that we know so that they can see that not all of the Asian American community, not all of the LGBT community are straight or white. That's what I meant, uh, that we are also Asian. So we want to promote understanding. And I'm so proud of the work that I had done with people in this group and also at the National Queer Asian Alliance for the past several years around pr promoting diversity and acceptance so that Asian American parents can fully recognize and appreciate and love their kids. I was proud to work with a network of mothers, both in Hawaii, 
uh, across the country who are Asian and shared their story of having trans, gender not conforming, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender kids. And imagine, and I want to show you one of these videos. Imagine if you are watching your favorite Bollywood soap opera uh, or your Chinese melodrama, and this video comes up. Oh no, wait, I'm not ready. Tai I do this because I love my son. We want to recognize the Asian Pride Project getting Capia for producing these wonderful videos. We have them in about eight, uh, nine different languages. That was obviously Chinese. Uh, we also have Korean, Tagalog, Hindi with English subtitles, Indian, uh, English with uh, uh, English subtitles. To demonstrate that we are LGBT and Asian, it's a long coming out process. It is not an event, it is a process. And check out NCAPIS web website, check out Asian Pride Project for the amazing work that these people are doing. Thank you so much for being here and thank you for giving this space for all of our opportunities to be who we are. Thanks. Thank you, Glenn, and thank you for sharing that uh, wonderful video. Uh, from the first speaker, Justin came to you. You talked about family acceptance in that last video. Really, was uh, very powerful. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, our next, uh, our final speaker, certainly not least, is uh, Alex Chen. Um, Alex, hi everybody. Well, it's hard to top that video. I am Chinese American, and I feel a little overclamped <laughs> just seeing that representation. Um, it makes me think of um, when I was um, still working at the National Center for Lesbian Rights, I went to a conference, a uh, gender conference in New York City, which um, was, you know, geared at sort of parents of trans kids and supporting them and supporting them in sort of being supportive of their children's journeys. And there was a panel at that event about um, for AP, API trans uh, parents of trans children, and it featured uh, parents who were supportive of their trans children talking about how they themselves came on this journey of acceptance and how they have now, you know, been instrumental in sort of reaching out to other people within their communities. And, you know, I just was so moved to be at that event. I remember just thinking about, you know, I think, imagine what it would have been like if when I was a kid, my family had this kind of language, they had this ability to understand my experience and how life-changing that would have been for me as a young person. And just to see parents who are out there now giving that support to their children and sort of showing that LGBT families and the people who are in these families look all these different kinds of ways. And so I just think it's so important that this type of um, video is being made, um, that Encapia is supporting this type of visibility. It is um, really, really important and so moving. So, you know, I think a lot of the panelists have had a lot to say because, you know, when you ask us to talk about a topic that's as broad as the connection between a community as diverse as the AAPI community and a community as diverse as the LGBT community, there are so many different facets of what we could talk about. But what I'd like to talk about a little bit today is to share a little bit about my own personal story and then to talk a little bit about how we might think about how an intersectional framework of looking at these multiple identities and people inhabiting multiple identities might change the way that we do legal work and the way that we operate legal workplaces. So to start with my own story, you know, I think that as a gay transgender Asian man, I've always been aware that there's not a lot of representation of almost all of my identities. And I've never, you know, I never grew up seeing people who sort of looked exactly like me, had my life experience. And so being aware of that invisibility on multiple angles. Um, and I think that one of the things that that's always caused is a sort of a sort of consciousness of whether or not one is adhering to or flouting a stereotype. So I'll share a story about that. When I was in law school, 
um, I applied for and received a, a prestigious fellowship uh, called the Paul and Daisy Soros Fellowship for New Americans. And it's geared towards um, basically people who are either immigrants or the children of immigrants who are now in graduate school um, in, the, in you know, whichever field and they want to do something with their career that would be helpful to society, right? And so it's like doctors, civil rights lawyers, artists and theater people, journalists, like all sorts of folks are in this program. Um, and it was a really meaningful part of my law school experience because it really enabled me to go and do a public interest career and afford to do that, even though um, you know I didn't have anybody to pay for my law school and I had to take out loans, right? So well, the thing I remember though is you know, you're know, you supposed to write about your story, right? And you're supposed to write about why it is that the work that you do is important. And when you're doing this kind of thing, I think the tension is always, um, you know, how much do you sort of want to like galvanize people's emotions versus do you feel like there's a version of that that is kind of like exploiting your own trauma or pain in order to get funding, right? I think that's always a tension when you do this kind of work of like, okay, you want to humanize people, but you don't necessarily want to make it this kind of like, you know, like crying children in the background kind of situation, right? And so I really resisted telling a story where, you know, there was an opposition or a clash between my Asian heritage and my transgender identity or my gay identity because I really felt that that wasn't accurate to my experience, really. I felt like, yes, you know, of course, people in my life had some challenges accepting me when there wasn't a lot of media representation, but at the same time, there was a lot of love, there was a lot of acceptance, there's a lot of history, as um, both Andy and Justice McKenna talked about, of, you know, different kinds of gender and sexual diversity within Asian culture, and so I think there was just a lot more complexity to what really my experience was than what people assumed, right? Um, and so I really didn't tell that story. And I remember is after I got the fellowship, they wrote a little blurb that was supposed to go into the brochure about me. Um, and somebody had ghost written my story based on my application essays and interviews. And they had this phrase in the, that said something like, torn between his Chinese American heritage and his sexual identity, Alex, blah, 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 blah. And I was like, okay, wait, wait, hold on, hold the phone. <laughs> I did not write that. I did not say that. I never even hinted it. I consciously went into this process saying, I'm not going to go and validate some like, you know, overarching societal narrative that Asian communities are more biased or homophobic than other communities, which I really don't think is part of my lived experience, um, and which I think ultimately benefits white supremacy, right? To sort of like have this view of self-satisfaction, like, oh, well, white people, you know, might um, historically have in this country been responsible for settler colonialism, but we're more enlightened when it comes to women's rights or LGBT rights, and that's what means we can go around the world and dictate to other people how their democratic development should go, right? And so I really didn't want to play into that narrative with my own journey. And yet there it was right there. And I have no idea who wrote that piece, but I, you know, obviously wrote them back and I said, look, like I didn't say this and I'm not saying it. Um, but you know, that story always sticks out to me because I feel like that is exactly what I'm always aware of, right? I think as a minority, you're aware of like, what are the predominant or prevailing stereotypes of your group? And whether you flout those stereotypes or you fulfill them, you're always aware of what the stereotypes are. And that's what psychologists refer to as like minority stress. Or, you know, um, Franz Fanon, the like acclaimed, you know, anti-colonial um, black um, theorist called, you know, black skins, white masks, right? The idea that you always have this double consciousness of like what people are going to see outside um, and what is on your inside. Um, and another mentor of mine, since we're talking about important influences, Jeannie Sue Gerson, who is the first Korean American woman to ever receive tenure at Harvard Law School, wrote a really moving article in The New Yorker about this, about sort of always being told that she was the exceptional Asian. It's like, oh, you're so creative unlike the other Asians. You have initiative and drive, unlike the other Asians. And so basically, there's no way to get out of your stereotype, right? Because either you fulfill the stereotype and then you validate it, or you flout the stereotype and then everyone's like, oh, you're you're the exception that proves all the other Asians are, are not like you, right? So there's really no way to get out of it. And so in the end, I kind of had to decide for myself, I'm just gonna have to live my life and be me. And people are gonna have to make the assumptions they make. And if I change people's minds over time about what it means to be any of my identity buckets, Let's just make that progress slowly, but I can't live thinking all the time about the way in which other people are thinking about my identity. Um, and, and I also can't live my whole life trying to dictate what other people are gonna care about, right? And I think it's really interesting that we're all here because there's been a spate of anti-Asian hate crimes. That's why even though this has been AAPI Heritage Month like every year since in the inception of whatever we decided that was gonna be a thing, this is the first year that I can remember the ABA is running a whole slate of programming. And that's happening all over the place. There's all these news media outlets that suddenly wanna interview Asian leaders. And like suddenly there's this kind of attempt to, to sort of educate the population about all of the rich ways in which we've been part of American history. That's great. Also, let's just recognize that's happening because suddenly everyone's decided it's a trend and so we're covering it. And so how as a society do we decide to platform certain ideas or identities and when do we decide that it's not a new story, right? And so I'm really glad it's happening. Also acknowledging it's happening because people out there are suffering and the suffering is getting spotlighted.
Um, so, you know, I think part of the work we can do with the moment, though, is, OK, well, maybe that's not a great reason, but you know, like, beggar, you know, we can't look a gift horse in the mouth when it comes to social justice advocacy, you kind of have to seize your moment. So we have a moment, we have a little bit of time, what are we going to do with it? I think part of what people are doing here on this panel is showing that there's this rich history of LGBT AAPI people and leaders playing a role in social justice communities, being an integral part of the way that we've thought about this work in America, um, and that it's not something that's new. And that these kinds of like facile narratives about like sort of like Asian opposition or, you know, like homogeneity are fundamentally, you know, both racist and a product of our appallingly sort of like non robust civics education that we just don't teach LGBT history. We don't teach AAPI history. And so people don't know about these things. And then it's always like you have to write on a new blank slate all the time, right? Because the next generation isn't being educated. Um, I also, though, want to use this as an opportunity to say, you know, when we're talking about diversity, what does that mean? Is that just like, oh, we're going to the first insert here, insert here, insert here, who's done insert here, right? What, what is that just what it is like that they're just going to do the same job the same way, but it's like a little bit of a different hue, right? So I, I like to call that United Colors of Benetton diversity. Like, I don't, I think United Colors of Benetton has now gone on business. But like when I was a kid, you always saw these like rainbow advertisers, advertisements where it's like a bunch of people of different colors and they're all wearing the same clothes, right? And like, I think a lot of the times these days when like, law firms or corporations talk about diversity, what they want is better than diversity. They just want to be able to say that they've ticked all the latest boxes that are supposed to be on the progressive agenda. And they don't actually want to meaningfully change anything about the way that they operate. And they don't actually imagine that bringing diversity into the fold is going to change the way that they operate. And the result is that the only people who can stick it out are the people who are willing to kind of play by the existing rules, right? And a lot of other people don't make it through because they actually believed the company when they said something like, we want to see your whole self at work. And they didn't understand that they went and we actually want to see a very carefully constructed part of your box, which is slightly more than it used to be, but not as much as you want to show. And it's actually very complicated to understand, like socially, what are the things that you're supposed to showcase that are supposed to be your whole self and a set of codes that is in some ways even more complicated than you weren't supposed to bring yourself to work, right? So that's actually like the situation that a lot of people are in when they're trying to bring themselves into work and change what things look like. So I think part of what it means to have meaningful diversity is to think about, okay, if we're really going to try to have different kinds of people and they bring a different perspective, does that change anything about how we do things? And so so part of that that I want to talk about now is like well, workplace processes, right? COVID has shifted the ball game in terms of what the default norm is for white collar work in America. Everyone now is more accepting of things like remote work, flex work. A lot of disability activists are sitting there going, you know, when we said that this is important, everyone said it was impossible. And now that everybody needs to do it, suddenly everything is possible, right? And so, you know, a lot of our existing workplace structures are not set up to welcome people from marginalized identities, people who need more health care, who need more flex time, who need more support for childcare, who need the ability to take care of their families. You know, we actually construct these workplaces that are really still based on like a very 1950s model of like there's a breadwinner and then there's a homemaker and the breadwinner can be there nine to seven and doesn't have to be there for anything else and you know can basically dedicate their entire resource to work and is located near their work and there's another person who doesn't have a career and they're the ones to take care of family right and actually that structure just does not reflect America's demographic reality at all it never really fully did it never really reflected the demographic reality of like black and brown people but it did reflect like a certain kind of upper to middle white class existence these days, it doesn't reflect hardly anybody's reality, right? And so how can we, as people who have those marginalized identities, who sometimes have stronger family ties, who have these kinds of different healthcare needs or different family needs, how can we advocate within our workplaces and use some of our own institutional power to make sure that we are transforming our workplaces in terms of things like the benefits, in terms of things like pay, right? A lot of minorities can't afford to do social justice work because the pay implies that you don't have to also support your family. But for a lot of us, we're the first members of our generation to make it in America, or you know the first generation to go to college and so there's a certain financial pressure and you can't just presume oh um i'm a white middle class cis woman and my husband is going to go into big law and so we don't actually have to pay our workers a living wage right we, we should think about are we paying our interns are we paying our fellows if you are a first generation immigrant and you are going to work in a summer law school because your family can't afford to pay for your education are you really going to go work for nothing or less than nothing or end up paying to work when on the other hand you could earn more money than your family's ever earned Right. And so what are we doing with our economic structures to incentivize people to go into certain types of careers and to be visible in certain types of careers? So I think part of it is thinking about things like that is also thinking about things like language access. You know, what access do we have for people whose English is not their first native language? What kind of affirmative outreach are we doing at diversity hiring to make sure that people are in the pipeline for this type of work? I think all of those things are a huge part of what can make diversity meaningful. And I think the other half of it 
um, and I don't, I don't have that much time, but just to briefly talk about this is, you know, expanding a little bit on the folks who gestured at, you know, Professor Kenji Yoshino's work and the covering framework. How can we think about the way that we're doing legal work, right? Because we work within a legal system that really balkanizes identities, you know, um, impact cases are about one kind of identity. This is a transgender child. This is a uh, Muslim American who's been discriminated against. And there's a sense that, you know, telling a more complicated story or having multiple types of issue-based claims would confuse judges or create law that wasn't as clean or historically just win less because judges get more confused. And if it's like a kind of discrimination that falls at the intersection, for example, if somebody calls a lesbian by like gender-based harassing slurs, is that anti-gay discrimination or is that sexist discrimination or is it both? The reality is sociologically it's both, but the legal you know, framework tries to split it into one or the other, right? And so there's just been these very strong incentives within our legal system against seeing identities as intersectional. But that also means that when people have intersectional identities, it's harder for them to get relief. And so I think part of the work we have to do is more enforcement work, right? We now have facial protections on the books for LGBTQ people plus for racial minorities. But at the same time, there's not enough work that's being done in actually making that vindicated, right? Like over 95% of Title VII claims for employment discrimination fail because you know, the judiciary has constructed an incredibly difficult set of standards that you have to meet to show discrimination, which doesn't match with the lived reality of how discrimination manifests on the ground. So what are we doing to think about that entire framework? Alex, uh, okay, Alex, I think uh, screen has frozen. So, Okay, great. I think uh, we'll see if you can get back on, but uh, thank you, Alex. To Alex, there you are. You were frozen for a few minutes, and I think you probably concluded, uh, but a <laughs> lot to... Uh, um, okay, so just I guess I'll just finish. I'll wrap up on the positive rights piece because I do think it's really important. It's really just thinking about the fact that within the American constitutional framework, we've really recognized only negative rights, which are rights where somebody is being mistreated in a way that it's like they're not being treated as equivalent like straight white man would be treated, right? But actually a lot of the challenges that we face in our society are more about positive rights, like the right to an education, the right to economic justice, things like the right to create a family of your LGBT, systemic reform work around the criminal justice system and how we treat incarcerated people and how we treat people who have contact with the criminal justice system. These are all types of things that are harder to do than simply make a negative rights argument. But if we're gonna achieve real justice in this country that makes people believe that we have a justice system that works for them, we have to be looking at it in a more creative way. And I think that that's another reason why we have to be thinking about things intersectionally. And it has to be something meaningful rather than just saying, we have people of a certain identity group doing the same work that we've always done before, because that's not going to get us far enough in making this country the country it can be. And this country is already a beacon in many ways. I already have a life here that I couldn't have in many other countries around the world. But at the same time, that doesn't mean our society is perfect. There's a lot of work we need to do. And we all can be a part of making American democracy more real and making our society more just. Great. Thank you, thank you Alex. And all to think about those issues with us. Thank you, Alex. Uh, appreciate you posing those hard questions, and and you were within your ten minute, but then you froze. So we appreciate it. So, um, you know, last thirty minutes, we want to spend as much time for the Q and A. So if you have uh, questions, please pose it in the Q and A box, not in the chat room, so we can um, uh, address those to our panelists. But before we do. Go to the Q&A. I do have one overall question for, for the panelists that I've asked them to think about. And it's kind of a big, broad uh, question. Um, you know, in light of the current accelerated demand for change in the years since the death of George Floyd and the reckoning that it prompted about race in America, you know, the insurrection on January 6th, the current landscape of the Supreme Court, not to mention the pandemic and the wave of AAPI hate crimes. And as we prepare for the next normal, what does this mean for the AAPI LGBTQ plus community? Glenn alluded to it somewhat in terms of it's a moment of allyship and what does that mean? Let's uh, start out with uh, Justice McKenna first. Hmm. Very good question. Um, one thing that I didn't mention um, is that, you know, uh, what the um, Williams Institute study also showed that um, AAPI LGBT adults are now more likely to say that they feel unsafe um, compared to AAPI, AAPI non-LGBT adults. 
17% of AAPI LGBT adults reported not feeling safe compared to 7% of AAPI non-LGBT adults. So, um, you know, I think, I think uh, Glenn and Andy and, and um, uh, Alex have made excellent points. Uh, we need to focus on uh, the positive rights um, and the intersectionalities. And we as a community uh, must come together with everyone else to improve our democracy, to improve the criminal justice and, so, and social justice in general. And um, instead of you know, just uh, intersectionality, you know, okay, so I am an Asian American lesbian woman, right? But I'm also an American, and I uh, want I want equity for everyone. It doesn't matter, you know. That's why you know I support the Black Lives Matter movement. I support the la la Latino population, the the Native Americans, and the the economically disadvantaged white people. You know, we must all strive for a better society. And, um, and uh, so we, we need to strive for everyone, not just ourselves. Thank you, Justice McKenna. Um, Andy? I think it's a, it's a really good question. And I think that, you know, Glenn in his remarks mentioned the need for an intersectional lens and you know, just anecdotally speaking, when news of the shootings happened in Atlanta started to become more mainstream, Korean language media actually picked it up far more quicker than um, English language media. Um, it was also, when news started to pour out about the Atlanta shootings, it was on the same day as the Senate Judiciary Hearing for the Equality Act. And, uh, I think for myself as, um, as someone who identifies as both being Korean American and trans, as being a trans woman, it was a really hard day, a bittersweet day um, to hold both of those identities. Um, I, I look at the challenges that face our community as Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders who also identify as being either queer or trans. And, you know, there are a number of issues that we should be, that we should be focused on and concerned about. And I think um, the, the survey that Justice McKenna referred to recently put out by the Williams Institute does a good job at providing some numbers, hard data around some of the concerns that are facing our community. Um, you know, some of the some of the data points that, you know, that I also had a chance to take a peek at is that, you know, most of our community is concerned about economic security issues, right? Um, and, you know, even more telling and getting even more into um, the weeds, as it were, looking at it by ethnic segment is that, you know, 40% of Native, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders are concerned about how they are going to feed themselves or feed their families compared to, you know, a, a significantly smaller um, population comparing to non LGBTQ native Hawaiian um, and Pacific Islanders. I think about the upcoming decision related to Fulton B city of Philadelphia. It's a religious exemptions case, but, and it largely centers on, um, uh, a faith-based uh, foster care agency. Um, but what's not being told in this narrative is that the decision will also impact um, places like soup kitchens or emergency shelter providers. Any faith-based institution that accepts taxpayer dollars um, uh, could, depending on the ruling or the opinion, uh, determine whether or not LGBTQ plus folks might be able to access those, those, those um, safety net providers. And I think about when you layer on uh, the identity of not just being LGBTQ plus, but also the reality of being Asian American. And you look at that just one example 
of what that ruling could determine. It could mean that there is one less place for a trans person of Asian American or Pacific Islander descent to be able to access a meal or to be able to access an emergency bed. Um, you, you look at, I also think, you know, on, to kind of conclude my remarks on a more uplifting note, I think what has been true um, beyond Black Lives Matter um, is that Asian Americans have particularly shown up in solidarity with other communities of color despite this, this, this stereotype or myth that somehow Asian Americans are the model minority and Asian Americans are being used as a, as a wedge of a community to pit against other communities of color. And I just, I, I think history tells a far different narrative, whether you look at folks who currently are organizing um, with Black Lives Matter activists, or if you look at like historical figures like Yuri Kochiyama, who organized alongside the Black Panthers, there is a history of solidarity work. And I think once we take a look through an intersectional lens and we take a look at the history that we all come from and derive from, I actually think that the current moment that we're in is full of possibility and full of potential. Um, potential for transformative change, not just for Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, not just for LGBTQ plus people, but for folks like us at the intersections of both of those identities and because of us. Great, thank you, Andy. Uh, Glenn? Um, I said what I said, I'm good. Okay. Can you expand a little more and you say it's an allyship for, it's a moment of allyship. Is there a different way to look at that today in the context of what's going on in, the, in our country and really the world? You've been at it for a long time. Is there something new, how we should approach that? So I posted in the chat a link to report bias. And, you know, advancing, my friends at Advancing Justice and Hala back uh, uh, have a training around bystander intervention. How an incident will happen and there's something that you can do. You know, the world would be so different if people were not, did not have camcorders at the time that Rodney King was beaten up by the LA police. Things would be so different if we didn't have iPhones uh, that have built-in cameras um, or smartphones, not to be uh, corporate endorsing, uh, where it's not for, at the time of which George Floyd, you know, was killed at the hands of Derek Chauvin. But it's not just videotape, it is a story. As lawyers, we work with words. We work with wordsmiths. And even if you put a videotape into evidence, you know, someone has to authenticate it. Remember the rules of evidence. And so putting a narrative out there where if you see something, say something. And you can speak up and record an incident of anti-Asian hate, anti-transgender mockery, sexism, and report it to Stop API Hate, or better, the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights. And y'all are lawyers. You know how to issue spot. You know factor rule application. You know how to develop a fact pattern. And if you see these stories, write it up. If the person cannot, as Alex, Ch Professor Chen said, if the person cannot speak for themselves, you can speak up for them and you don't need their consent to observe and to write up what you had found. The reason why that's important is because it gives the advocates like Andy, the ability to track the incident and the FBI. So on what kind of incidents are happening and where do we need to invest resources? So the moment of allyship is a moment of action. Again, 60% of Americans have seen the blaming or the victimization of an Asian for COVID-19. How many times have we been in spaces where the word faggot, lezzy, 
you know, a gender non-conforming pejorative has been used and we haven't said anything. It is now where you could say something for others, use those resources, help us to do this work. Wonderful, thank you, Glenn. Uh, Alex, anything to add? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, your original question was kind of centered around, you know, allyship um, from AIPI people and LGBT people to um, Black Lives Matter. And I think that it's really important um, what, with both of these communities, right? I think to acknowledge that really the predominant fault line in American history in terms of dividing people into groups is anti-Blackness. And basically, you know, if you are not relegated to the category of Black as another kind of group, you assimilate into whiteness because you become part of the homogenous majority mass and continually you're going to be defined against Blackness, right? And so really, you know, I think the API community and the LGBT communities are both communities that have a really wide range of experience levels, a wide range of demographics involved, a wide range of privilege, a wide range of education levels, a wide range of socioeconomic power. And there's going to be an invitation for many of us to feel safe and comfortable in the existing regime and to say, well, we got ours and we did fine. So, you know, those other people over there, we don't have to worry about what's going on there. But I'd like for all of us here to think about the psychic cost and the identity cost of making that bargain, right? Because really the bargain comes with accepting a framework where you don't have cultural confidence in your own heritage and communities and where you're accepting a majority framework and you're accepting being part of that. And all that involves a lot of compromise with yourself in terms of what you say and what you don't say and how you appear in the workplace and society. And we're making those decisions all the time, right? About how we're going to show up or not show up for other people, how hard we're gonna work to try and lift other people up after us. And so I think we all are gonna be faced with that choice. And many other ethnic groups have faced that choice and many of them have bifurcated or split in how many of those people chose to assimilate into whiteness and how many of them didn't, right? And so I think we're gonna be facing that choice in both of these communities into the future. And I think that in making those choices, we wanna think about, well, what are the choices that make people feel vulnerable and wanting to assimilate into that system of power? A lot of it is about economic and cultural insecurity, right? It's about being afraid of being at the bottom of American society because we see that this is a country where it's bad to be on the bottom of society because we treat low income workers with very little respect because we have no safety nets, because we don't have enough money for people's retirement, because we don't have a very good healthcare system. People are desperately afraid to be at the bottom of this pyramid because they see how good life is for people at the top and how bad life is for people at the bottom. And people say, I don't wanna be at the bottom and I don't wanna look with like people who are at the bottom and they look a certain kind of way, I'm gonna act differently so that I get to the top, right? And that's one way to deal with a system of inequality, another way to deal with it to say, nobody should be at the bottom of this. Nobody deserves to be treated like this. And even if we have a meritocracy, what does that mean? You were born smart, so you get to be in the 1% and to have vacation in Malibu, and you weren't born with certain types of genetic advantages that privilege us in this society. And so you should live a life of, you know, indignity and disrespect and penury and pain. Like that doesn't make sense on a moral level, but it's an understandable reaction on a human level. So how do we change that framework and say, it benefits all of us for the bottom of the society to not suffer the way that it does. And it benefits all of us to correct these systems so that we don't all suffer from them. And what are the, what, who benefits when the affirmative action debate is about Asian kids as pitted against black and brown kids, as opposed to the elephant in the room being legacy and sports admissions, right? And the massive role that that plays in the way that we distort for example, entry to higher education. Um, why do we think about you know, the criminal justice reform as not being an issue that affects AIPI people when API people are incredibly vulnerable within that system and are subject to discrimination from juries and judges and police officers and prison guards and suffer from egregious levels of violence within the criminal justice system, right? Who benefits from not telling that story? So I think we should think about how do we build a more just society as involving understanding the role that we can play as either complicit within the existing racial and economic dreams, or as people who can find areas and places where we can challenge that. And I think that's a task that we all have to take on as a society and we have to take on as a cultural matter, as well as a legal and political matter. Great, thank you, Alex. Uh, there are a couple of questions in the um, q and I think I'm just gonna kind of combine them and, and, and ask you to address one if you have anything else to add. The first one really, uh, what we've been talking about, how to eliminate discrimination against LGBTQ community. And so um, if you want to address that, anything else to add with that, please do so. But the next question is, what are some suggestions for bringing your whole self to work and changing the culture? 
let's start out with Glenn. Glenn, because you, I know you mentioned uh, Professor Yoshino's work about covering, and that's you know somewhat related to that. So, Glenn, you know, I I wish you caught me on the last, so I'll do the I'll be the downer, and then maybe somebody else can be a lot uplifting. You cannot. We are lawyers. <laughs> And law is about the perception of our talent and our wit. And the DEI messages of, of authenticity, of bringing your whole selves to work. Look, if I really wanted to be, you know, my whole self, and I'd show up like in court, you know, and Andy knows this, with high heels and with like maybe a little bit of blush. I love it. But for my client and for my practice, I have to present in a gender normative way. Now, I understand this is improper, this is wrong, this buys into gender normal, normal, normal heteronormativity, but as lawyers, our profession is about our clients and their trust of us for the perceptions of our ability to take on a white supremacist, gay, white, male, heteronormative, Circumstance that I think is wrong, improper, unfair, and oftentimes true. So sadly, I do not think we can be authentic as lawyers. Companies and other places I think are different. But Alex, I'm hoping that you have a counterpoint because I hate having to say this, but this is what I believe in. Alec, you raise your hands immediately, so I know that you have a counterpoint. So. Yeah, I mean, look, I'm not, and I'll say this saying, look, I'm trans, but I'm not, I'm not non-binary or gender non-conforming in the way I present at work, right? So this is not a part of my own lived experience. And so I don't want to speak on behalf of people who have to navigate that experience and how difficult it is. I will say as a plug that my uh, clinic, the Harvard LGBT clinic is collaborating with the American Bar Association SOGI Commission, among other organizations, including the National Association for Law Placement and the LGBT Bar, Beyond Binary Legal and the National Trans Bar, on a resource which is gonna be focused on how to improve um, working conditions for attorneys and legal workers who are non-binary. And we've talked to dozens of non-binary legal practitioners about the kinds of issues that they face. And look, Glenn, everything you're saying is totally true, right? Professionalism, like false constructs of professionalism and the way that that's weaponized against both gender non-conforming people, as well as, you know, black and brown folks who have different kinds of hair and many other kinds of ways in which professionalism manifests has a deeply toxic hold on the legal profession. And of course, the, the it's always the buck is always passed to somebody else. It's always like, oh, I don't have a problem with it, but the client might have a problem with it. And if the client doesn't have a problem with it, the court is gonna have a problem. If the court doesn't have a problem, the jury is gonna have a problem. And one of the things we're doing in that publication is telling people's stories to show how actually when people do show up authentically at work, they do better work and they do better with their clients. And we have a great story, for example, that we're gonna be showcasing the publication from a public defender um, who's given me permission to share the story uh, where you know basically what happened with that public defender is that they, present it as non-binary in the in the um even in the criminal justice setting and um they were being demeaned and misgendered by opposing counsel and def the defendant that was their client showed a lot of sympathy that to the person and afterwards was acquitted of the crime and when they went to talk to the jury about you know what was effective about their presentation they said you know he was so sympathetic to you when the other lawyer was being so rude and awful and we just thought somebody who could do that couldn't have committed the crime so you know Sure. On the one hand, sometimes maybe you lose a client or, you know, your case might not go as well because of that, but maybe you're not stressed all the time about what you're wearing and how you can't show up authentically. And, you know, as a result, maybe you do better work or maybe the way that people interact with you is humane and empathetic. And that changes the way people think about, you know, the case. And so I think, you know, we maybe accept these things and maybe changing them does involve putting your toe in the water, trying things out. It's terrifying. It's haphazard. And it might not always go perfectly well, but I don't think we can change the way that we live in the workplace and that we live in society without that kind of effort. I think storytelling is a big part of it. Showcasing representation is a big part of it. And so I don't want to leave it there because I think your lived experience is super real, Glenn, but that's not, this, that's not where I want to leave this. I don't want to just accept that and move on. And if we just accepted that and moved on, neither Andy or I could be here on this panel right now with you today because it wouldn't have been seen as professional for us to live in our authentic selves. And so I just don't want us to settle for where we are. I want us to keep looking into the future and what else we can change about the way that we treat each other. Great, thank you, Alex. Um, this is McKenna. And, just uh, quickly, I know you, we're probably running out of time, but I just want to say that, you know, as a trial judge, I presided over, you know, hundreds of jury trials. And the, I, I will say that the lawyers 
did fine just being themselves, whoever they were. And it's, I think it's better to be yourself, whoever you are. And I also have hope for the future because I can tell you that I come from a generation which I, I told you, you know, it was DSM three. When I was a senior in high school, homosexuality was a, uh, was a mental illness. Times are changing. The younger generation is changing. I have taken the Harvard IAT tests. I have implicit biases against working women, against LGBT people, of people of color. This is a society in which I grew up in, okay? But my daughter doesn't. So I have hope. Great, thank you, Justice McKenna. Um, Andy, did you wanna add anything? Maybe you, you can speak as you know, leader of uh, TELDEF, um, maybe talk a little about authentic leadership and what that means to you from that angle? Well, I look at one of our programs at TELDAF and it's probably our, our what we're most widely known for, but it's our Name Change Project. And the Name Change Project is focused on providing free legal name changes to transgender and non-binary people um, by partnering them with pro bono counsel um, to help them through the process. Depending on the jurisdiction, it might require a court appearance. Um, it might require filling out any number of forms and it may also come with fees, um, depending on where you live and where the project operates. Um, in 2020, um, we worked with more than 60 law firms across the country. Uh, and that resulted in, I want to say, more than 15,000 pro bono hours donated, value, valued at more than $8.5 million. I'm very proud that I can rattle that off. What's important about the Name Change Project, though, um, and I think in, in kind of shifting and contributing to shifting the culture that I think many, many attorneys, particularly those that work at big law firms experience, is actually engaging with their clients. So more than 50% of our clients um, identify as being folks of color, trans folks of color or non-binary folks of color. And um, what, what really, really hurts um, is that more than half also identify as living below the federal poverty line. So that's, that's $12,000 on an annual basis. What I have found to be one of the most powerful transformative experiences um, in working with law firms um, across the country is the Name Change Project. And seeing um, attorneys, whether they're summer associates or senior partners, watching them get to know the client, get to know their story and their lived experience, and to be able to represent them in having their name, their name change completed. Um, and in that very transactional experience, I think many of our pro bono counsel who participate in the project, it's a very simple and straightforward process for the, for the most part. Um, something changes. And many of the attorneys we work with are not a part of the community and have never, never met a trans person before. And yet over time, since the project was founded in 2007, we have seen some even, I would, I would say even more excitedly, we have seen some conservative law firms do a complete flip when it comes to engaging with pro bono work, particularly at the intersections of gender identity and expression. Um, so much so that we have probably more pro bono attorneys um, than we do have uh, cases to assign at any given time. Um, and so I, I just lift up that story um, in particular because, you know, change in any institution is tough, particularly in the legal field. Um, and yet it's happening. And I think as part of that change, we are also, I, I don't want this to get lost on folks either. We are seeing attorneys that are coming to TILDEF and saying, my child has come out as trans, what do I do? And that experience in itself has, and us working with attorneys, you know, privately or in, in public ways, has also dramatically shifted, um, 
I think the landscape in which we work, as well as the, the, the witnessing, I think, a cultural shift um, in law firms across the country as well. So um, I, I did want to lift that up. The last thing I'll say, and because no one has talked about it, and there was a question around what do we do around federal, um, around making sure that people who are LGBT plus don't experience legal discrimination in this country, pass the Equality Act. It's simple as that. It is a bill that's currently in the Senate um, that is designed to uh, amend um, the Civil Rights Act and a number of other federal laws to make sure that explicitly sexual orientation and gender identity are protected classes um, on everything ranging from uh, public accommodations to housing to credit, jury service. Um, and this law is, it would, if passed and signed into a law, into a law would mean that LGBTQ plus discrimination would be illegal across the country. Currently, 29 states do not have state laws in the books that protect, explicitly protect LGBTQ plus people. Um, and passing the Equality Act would be one big step forward um, in making sure that our community has both access to legal and lived equality. Great, thank you, Andy. And thank you for um, answering actually the last question in the Q&A, or at least addressing it somewhat from Sabrina Dent. I didn't realize we had another Sabrina. So there's a Sabrina Dent. Of course, we had Sabrina, Justice McKenna. Well, this concludes our panel. Uh, I wanna thank all of you for uh, joining us for this webinar. We encourage you to check out the other webinars that are uh, on the ABA website that Ali posted um, for more information about those other additional programs. We really would like to express our gratitude to this esteemed group of panelists uh, you are all doing such critical work, and we thank you for taking the time uh, out of your busy schedule to share experience, and uh, also really for being uh, inspira too inspirational and role model. Um, we can't thank you enough. Thank you. The section of civil rights and social justice uh, provides free webinars and resources for legal professionals and advocates nationwide. We hope this helps you in your work. And again, if you can please consider joining and being active in the ABA, uh, you may do that at uh, ambar.org, americanbar.org. So best of luck and stay safe. And uh, I wanna quote Glenn uh, as my final words that this is a moment of action. So uh, good, good 